many of you exceedingly keen, I note, to uh, kick me in the slats in the comments yesterday concerning my position on that ridiculous Tesla Semi. Now, have I decided to repent and apologise, fall on my sword, accept the Messiah into my life? We'll have to wait and see. But I thought in the meantime, in this video, we might address some of your more entertaining comments. I'm John Cadogan from AutoExpert.com.au and I get new cars cheap. Australia only website. Card. My heart was as heavy as a field of butterflies in spring this morning when I dialed into YouTube analytics and I discovered that yesterday's report on the Tesla Semi, that abomination, has become the most hated video on my channel in recent memory. Like, dude, I'm normally up there at 98.7% likes, but this one, 88.8%. That means one in eight of you hated it. And that means I am halfway to my stated goal of one in four haters. So this is your opportunity. Don't miss it. Dislike this video now and subscribe. You know you want to. This report is sponsored by NordVPN. Now, I'm not a hardcore IT guy, but I've heard enough, especially recently, about data breaches, scams and hacks to know that being online can be inherently risky and costly. You don't have to be tech savvy to use NordVPN. It's a simple one-stop cybersecurity solution. One click and you are protected from hackers, malware and pop-ups across as many as six devices. NordVPN is the world's fastest VPN. I don't even notice it running in the background, frankly, and it only costs about as much as a cup of coffee to keep your data, your identity, and your devices secure every month. NordVPN can also save you money because you can assign your virtual location to another country where, for example, flights and accommodation might be cheaper than they are back at home. The same goes for streaming services, and you can access live sporting events and other content that may not be available where you actually live. It's a pretty small price to pay for cyber security, not to mention the potential savings also on the table. Go to nordvpn.com slash AEJC to get a huge discount off your plan plus four months free. Totally risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. That's nordvpn.com slash AEJC. Link in the description. And thanks to Nord for sponsoring this episode. Now, here's what you said I said about the Tesla Semi. We'll start with Ruka Solo. Hans, big brother, perhaps. You didn't figure in the weight of a 12-litre diesel engine, nor the gearbox against the weight of electric motors and drivetrain, nor the 1,000-litre fuel tank. Tesla Semi is indeed a bullshit concept that cannot work, but if you're gonna do the maths, do all of them. Smiley face. Men should not emoji. Ruka. Anyway, I've got hundreds of those comments. You didn't include the reduction. The central thesis is that I didn't say, well, there's a big heavy battery there, but we have to compensate because they pulled out the diesel engine and the transmission and things of that nature. And certainly they do weigh something when you change the fundamentals of a truck or a car, whatever. A Cummins X12 engine, I looked it up. 2,050 pounds, 931 kilos, if you're from around here. A Road Ranger gearbox is about 300 kilos, 1,000 litre of fuel. Let's call that 1,000 kilos because you have to put it in tanks and the tanks weigh something. So there's another 1,000 kilos. So let's call that 2.2 tonnes in total. How dare I not include that in my assess more of that ridiculous electric shitbox. How dare I? 
I'd suggest, though, on the counterbalancing side, you know, like the counterfactual here, is that the Tesla Semi does add rather a large inverter because it would have to surge to a megawatt of output because you have to get DC out of the battery and convert it to AC for the three motors. And I did kind of look up what the power must be if you're going to get from... 0 to 60 in Miracle, which is 0 to 100 here. If you're going to do that in 20 seconds with 40 tonnes-ish worth of total mass, then, dude, you're going to need slightly more than 750 kilowatts to do that. So that's rather a lot, isn't it? The big inverter is required, in other words. Um, you'd need a dirty big cooling system for that too. Plus it has to actively cool the battery when the battery's being charged. So it's not as if we're getting rid of the cooling system. And uh, you do have three motors, each with massive reduction gearing built in, because if memory serves, based on the Model S Plaid uh, specifications, they do spin at 23,000 and change RPM. And you have to get them down to 500 and something at the wheels, I mean, at 100 k's an hour, your average truck wheel is spinning at about 500 RPM. So there's a, a massive fixed gearbox there that has to be capable of withstanding all of the the load of inertia, etc., imposed on it and things of this nature. So that truck is definitely going to be heavier. And the question is, how much heavier? And dude, there's an obvious conclusion here and there's obvious empirical evidence that's hidden in plain sight, I'd suggest, to anyone that did more than just go with their gut on this. Like, there really is. So I'm going to play some thinking music for you at the moment, and we'll see if you can engage more than two brain cells and draw the conclusion about why I did not include those things in yesterday's report. Because I didn't forget about it. I did that on purpose. David Gray, here's the thinking music, okay? I think you forgot to allow for weight of combustion engine, so that should be taken off weight of battery. Think what you want, David, but only argue the things that can be argued for using facts, dude. And Philip Hagen, who says, I think you may have forgotten to deduct the weight of the motor, gearbox and diesel fuel from the weight of the Tesla. It doesn't weigh 14 tonnes plus 5 tonnes for their battery. I didn't forget that, dudes. It's simply not significant. Like, just look at electric vehicles and combustion vehicles hidden in plain sight in the marketplace today and do an apples for apples comparison of EV versus internal combustion. And when you do that, you discover that when you change a combustion vehicle to an electric vehicle, guess what? The mass of the electric vehicle increases by an amount that is slightly more than the weight of the battery. This happens everywhere, every time they do it. So, dude, here's an example of that. F-150, that's in the news. People are all cock-a-hoop about that, aren't they? The Platinum S Super Cab, 2.246 metric tonnes. That's what it weighs. This is the combustion one, OK? The Lightning version of the same thing, 3.116 tonnes. The difference, 870 kilos more. And the battery, well... It weighs 818 kilos. So the mass of the F-150 increases by slightly more than the weight of the battery. That's interesting. Because obviously you've got to add additional features. Do you not turn the combustion one into the electric one? There's all this cabling, for example, and all other kinds of systems that need to be added. When you get a Hyundai Kona, combustion and you turn it into electric the 64 kilowatt hour one it goes up by about 390 kilos and I looked hither and thither for the weight of the battery and couldn't found uh, couldn't found it so 
<laughs> I estimated the weight of the battery based on 200 watt hours per kilogram and 320 kilos for the battery dude so read them and weep the weight has increased by slightly more than the weight of the battery and this happens everywhere and I thought if you've been paying attention to electric cars that you would have just figured that out for yourself by now. I didn't forget to include those things. They're simply not relevant. If you want to know how much more the electric version of anything weighs, its mass increases by slightly more than the weight of the battery. Over to you. Find an example of a vehicle that contravenes this basic rule. But the mass goes up. And the other thing about the mass, right, is that if you're going to make, for example, a lot of people said that the battery was structural in the Tesla Semi. And I'd suggest this to you if you're one of them. Certainly the battery has to be in a box. It needs to be in a metal case for protection to enclose the cooling system, to protect the various sensors and things of that nature that allow external systems to protect the battery, temperature sensors and charge and discharge rate, this and that, right? Battery condition monitoring, etc. It's got to have all that stuff in it. And that stuff cannot fail. It has to be in a box. And if you're going to make the box structural, then okay. But it's not going to be optimised as a structural element because it contains the battery. And if you want to optimise it as a structural element, it would be shit at holding the battery. That's just the nature of compromise, okay? So there's that as well. Now, who should we do? Um, fat Juicy. Reminds me of wife number four. Anyway, the fuel and maintenance cost savings is huge. The safety features added bonus in America they allow 2K more weight. Elon is yo daddy. Thank you, Fat. Mr. Juicy. Might be a woman, who knows? Ms. Juicy. Ms. Juicy would be unfortunate, wouldn't it? You know, she'd learn how to fight, I suppose. Anyway, in the context of maintenance, shall we do maintenance? Tyres, cooling systems, suspension, dampers, etc. All the same as combustion, because... Slightly worse, actually, because the vehicle's going to be heavier when it's rolling around unladen, so there's that. 2,000 pounds is 909 kilos extra. I did not know that. So those of you who pointed out that the Tesla Semi, by virtue of it being an electric truck, gets an extra 2,000 pounds of GVM in America, thank you for letting me know that. I did not know, and now I do. That's 909 kilos, so yay. Fuel and maintenance costs, however, right? They're going to be offset by the following, okay? There's going to be a football field of solar that you're going to need to have, <laughs> essentially, on the roof of your warehouse per Tesla Semi, if that's the way you want to charge it. And the sun's got to shine, obviously. And then there's the pesky and enduring problem of payload efficiency, the reduction in payload efficiency because the thing is so much heavier. It's going to be five to five and a half tons heavier. Now, here's how this works, right? Yesterday, I opined that the likely reduction in payload efficiency was going to be minus, I actually said minus 21%. That was just based on the numbers that came out following my best estimation of the performance of this thing. But let's say that I was a bit wrong. Let's be kind. Let's steel man this argument. And let's say the reduction in payload efficiency is only, only 12.5%, okay? That means one in eight reduction in payload efficiency. What does that actually mean if we go down 12.5%? Let's run the numbers on that and pretend that we're trucking operators, okay? Let's say you've got a pretty efficient fleet, you're a logistics professional, you've got 40 trucks and 80 drivers, they're running two shifts, you're maxed out for efficiency, and you're moving 100% of the freight that you need to move to honour your contracts with your 40 combustion trucks. Happy days, right? But you see the news release and you say to yourself, maybe I should upgrade T3 
into that shit box. Yes. What happens? Well, if you want to do the same work, if there's a reduction in payload efficiency, which I'm very generously estimating at 12.5%, your 40 uh, combustion trucks, if you replace them with 40 semis, they're only going to do the same work as 35 combustion trucks, aren't they? Because one in eight, okay? So you're going to need, do the numbers yourself, dude, it's not that hard. You're going to need 46 Tesla semis to replace your 40 combustion trucks to do the same work, right? To haul the same cargo. And that means you're going to have 14 and a bit percent more trucks on the road. And obviously it's 45 and a bit when you do the numbers, but you can't have a fractional truck. You have to buy them in holes. And to do the same work, you're going to need 46 of them. But it's not just the trucks, is it? When you think about it, and you really do need to think, 46 trucks is going to require 92 drivers. So that means you're going to have 92 drivers instead of the 80 that you did. You're going to have to find the salary and the on costs for another 12 heads in your staffing budget. Good luck with that. You're also going to have to do about 15% more maintenance and logistics because you're going to have to do more driving, more trucks on the road, driving the same number of payload tonnes hither and thither to get paid. Okay, so there's going to be 15% more tyres and other maintenance and there's going to be 15% more on costs generally, which I'd suggest is enough to give many trucking operators the difference between a black balance sheet and a red one. Because it is a highly competitive industry. So unless the government steps in and rebates the operators of electric trucks, how is that actually going to work? And of course, your internal combustion engine trucking competitor, well, he can still get the same job done with 40 trucks and 80 drivers, can he not? So that's going to be a problem for you the next time those contracts come up for tender. So unless there is some significant incentive that's not commercially driven, like not commercially driven in the context of the free market, then you're fucked, basically, is what I'm saying. Now, M. Max. He's stating the payload at 18 tonnes by assuming the Tesla truck must weigh five tonnes more than a conventional semi. That is not considering removing the diesel engine transmission driveline, fuel tanks and structural changes of the chassis itself. The reality is we don't know what it actually weighs until it's released. However, this gentleman, obviously, this gentleman's logic is flawed in that respect. We've covered off the stuff about the weight. I'm not wrong about the weight. Wait and see, because eventually the numbers will be released. On that mass, though, the Tesla truck has basically the same drivetrain layout as the Model S Plaid, okay? At least in terms of its motor setup. And those motors rev to 23,000 and a bit RPM. They have to, to make the power. So if you're going to gun it, at a GVM of 40 tonnes, okay, 0 to 100, 20 seconds, 750 kilowatts at 23,000 RPM, assuming 100% efficiency for the conversions. You're going to be hauling a total mass of 40 tonnes for that 20 seconds doing that. That's a big job. This is going to require a gearbox with 44 to 1 reduction gearing, transmitting 750 kilowatts in total. It's actually three gearboxes transmitting 250, one for each motor, against 40 tonnes of inertial load. And I don't see any of the hardware doing any of that being particularly lightweight. I don't think any of us will be running uphill carrying any of it anytime soon. And I'd furthermore suggest that there's a reason that the stats on the semi are not released. You can't see the data anywhere and I don't think that's by accident. In fact it cannot be by accident. 
The reason is the data makes the truck look like a piece of shit. It would interfere with the narrative. They're not being disclosed for a reason. Now, one of these light bulb moments that I got when I stopped being an engineer and I became a journalist. I was working on tabloid TV on a current affair for the Nine Network. This is about 20 years ago. And I was doing one job on location somewhere with a really senior producer. We were talking about this and that. And he said, yeah, I was talking about interviews and interviewing and that kind of journalism stuff. And he said, yeah, what you've got to do is listen for what they're not saying because often what a subject doesn't say tells you everything. And this is true in the corporate world as well, because when corporations disclose information about vehicles, about policies, about whatever, they not only tell you what they want you to hear, okay, they don't tell you what they don't want you to hear. So you've got to listen hard for that. What are they not saying? This is true of politicians also, right? So Tesla is saying fuck all about the truck. They won't disclose the weight of the battery, for example. They won't disclose the weight of the truck. They won't do any of that stuff, and they're doing it for a reason, because it interferes with the narrative that they're trying to set up. What other reason could it possibly be? Because if there was miraculous battery technology and these batteries were lighter than a bee's dick and just twice the chocolatey goodness plus they prevent tooth decay... Don't you think the Messiah would be up with his friggin' megaphone just letting us all have it? Because he would really have kicked a goal here. This is just the hyperloop of electric trucks. And if you can't see that, then one of us has got a problem, and it ain't me. Okay? Let's talk to Gringle now, just to close this one off, shall we? Because this is pretty good too. Many warehouse rooftops could handle a few megawatts of solar. Could they? That's probably true hypothetically, but solar cells for various reasons because of the performance of the semiconductors and because there's only a limited amount of the spectrum that actually causes the photovoltaic effect and other factors of this nature, they're kind of limited in practice to about 20% efficiency. Plus, they get dirty and immediately after you deploy a solar panel, its efficiency drops permanently. Like, it's just one of those spooky things. 20%, okay? Therefore, each megawatt is going to require 5 megawatts of incident sunlight to get the job done. That's orthogonal incident sunlight, which hardly ever happens because the sun moves across the sky. And P.S., it's never directly overhead at any time of the year except if you're between the Tropic of Capricorn and the Tropic of Friggin' Cancer, okay? It's never directly overhead. So it's generally inclined. And let's just say the sun is at sort of, incidentally, no pun intended, but incidentally, sunlight is 1,000 watts per square metre, bang on, orthogonally, okay? One kilowatt per square metre, more or less, okay? But if the sun's at sort of 45 degrees to the array that you've got, you know, your array could be like that and the sun could be like this or whatever, but if it's at 45 degrees in any angle, then you're going to need about 7,000 square metres per truck, Okay, 7,000 square metres. So if you've got this warehouse logistics facility with the capacity to field 10 trucks, like 10 loading bays, and the plan is to charge them up while they're in place, you're going to need 70,000 square metres of solar array. Okay, that's seven football fields, more or less, of solar array just above you. And... P.S. The sun has to be shining. So if it's overcast, that's not going to work. And if it's night time when you want to load the trucks, that's not going to work. So why invest in the charging infrastructure if you're not going to do it just in the middle of the day and it's got to be sunny, blah, blah, blah. I don't see solar as a real alternative to the grid for a full-on 
logistics business because it really can't be trusted. At the at best, you could augment the charging with some solar if you can work that out. But relying on a, a quote unquote a few megawatts of solar to keep your trucks rolling around, tell him he's dreaming. Okay. And finally, John H, who says the solution for Australia may be interchangeable batteries stored at a change depot slash fuel station. I'm guessing Elon won't be redesigning his pride and joy for us Aussies. This is a bit of a radical thought, but one that may be achievable in relation to increased range. Well, John, I'd suggest let's not be holding our breath for interchangeable batteries because this is really not the same as changing the battery, the starting cold cranking battery in a car. Okay, it's really not the same as that. Electric car batteries are pretty well integrated into the vehicle. And yeah, they could be removed. They can be removed. They can be replaced. But it's a hell of a big job because it's not just a matter of pulling the battery terminals off and unbolting a couple of things and taking the battery away. You know, in the case of a relatively mundane electric vehicle, the battery is going to weigh about half a ton let's say. So you've got to have lift facilities for that. It's also going to have an active cooling system connected, plus all these sensors. It's got to integrate with the CAN bus in the vehicle, and that's going to be a hell of a problem. And then there's the liability issue, because your car, your truck, whatever, it comes with a battery from the factory. And if you really think it's a good idea to just take that one out and put it in some sort of collective battery uh, storage facility and get someone else's maybe shitty battery that's been in service for a lot longer, might have a defective component, battery might have a catastrophic thermal runaway on the way down the road, and there's your cargo just up in flames. Or let's just say that it, you've got some time-sensitive cargo, it's refrigerated, whatever, it's going to spoil. If the battery fails... 250 miles down the track from where you changed it out, that's going to be something of a liability issue as well. And it could be a million dollars worth of cargo in the back of the truck. So in the case of personal EVs, it's not feasible to change batteries over because it's too complex. You can't. You need a highly trained person to do it. They would need to have specific lifting gear and it's going to take longer than recharging right? So what is the advantage again to having these, this fantasy about let's just change the batteries quickly? Dude, it doesn't work like that. Now, if you want to have a shot at me about this, I'd love to hear it, but I'm not motivated to repent based on any of the feedback that I received yesterday. And I did find it hilariously entertaining that so many people would just go with their guts and say, oh, he forgot about the engine and the gearbox that's being taken out and whatever, right? If you actually look at what's happening with vehicles and you run the numbers and see how it actually plays, that's not the case at all. You cannot go with your gut when you're interfacing with reality because when you do that, you look like a peanut. So try a bit harder. Please tell me where I'm wrong exactly in the comments. Let me have it. I'm up for that. And please get the dislikes to at least 25%. Lift your game, in other words. You know you've got this in you.